I think we're live on Facebook now. So good evening, good after good afternoon, and good morning to every part of the world. So this is uh, GL from IELTS Filipino IELTS Filipino News Group. So with me, Mr. M, one of the administrators of the page. So Mr. M, good evening. Hi, good evening, Miss Gladys. Good morning, uh, good morning, Eli. I think good morning, sir, in your place. Yeah, and almost. welcome to two o'clock. Ah, okay. okay. Good afternoon, okay. Eli. So All we're right. live now in the IFNG together with Miss Gladys and Sir Jeff. All right. So Sir Jeff is still on on duty. So so today, uh, tonight rather, I would like to introduce you our expert from IELTS, IELTS teacher from English Pro Tips, just in seven and above in the IELTS writing test. So with us, it's Mr. Eli Howes. Good evening, Eli. Yeah, pleasure to meet you. Thank you for inviting me on. All right. Okay, so I think we may start now, the lecture. Okay, sure. So um, I see that there's more people being added to the Zoom uh, meeting every second. So I'll just kind of explain a little bit about what we'll be doing today while a few more people join. So um, there was a, an assignment where uh, students were asked to give a task one and a task two answer. And I think from those assignments, um, one task one and one task two assignment was chosen. And what we'll be doing today is looking through those assignments, uh, working out what score they would get if it were in the real IELTS exam. And then I'll also be giving you some tips and strategies for answering task one and task two in the real exam. Now you'll have to forgive me because this is the first time I've ever done a live Zoom lesson. So the technology might be confusing for me. And I'm sure if I get a little bit stuck, then Gladys will come back in and be able to give me some guidance. But what I'm gonna do now is share my screen and we're going to be looking at um, the first task one assignment. So here we have it. Okay, so this was the task that you were given. Um, it says the table below shows the population in millions of eight countries in 2008 and 2018. It also so shows the percentage growth in population between these two dates. Uh, so we re uh, received a few different answers for this and then one was chosen and I'm basically gonna go through their answer um, and show you how we can take their answer and improve it to um, a band seven plus style answer. Um, so what we'll do first is just kind of get a general correction of the vocabulary and the grammar in the answer. And um, you'll have to let me know if I move too quickly or too slowly, but what we'll do is I'll, I'll be talking you through the corrections that I make. So first of all, how do I make corrections onto this? Okay. Right, now I'd like to make suggestions for the Google Doc, but I can't seem to open that. Let me see if I can figure out a way. Uh, Gladys, if you're present, you can always, ah, here we go. Okay, so they started with the introduction. They say, the table gives information about the population and its percentage growth among the eight countries selected in the span of a decade. Okay, so it's quite nice to see a nice short introduction, which is what the examiner ultimately wants to see for academic task one. Uh, let's see how we could improve it. So we've got the table gives information about the population. Okay, so let's get rid of the, so about population and percentage growth um, among, and we don't need the again, among eight countries selected. So we don't really need the selected either. So we're gonna say the eight, among eight countries, and then we're gonna change this to over, over the span of a decade. Now, decade is a very nice word that means 10 years and they've appropriately chosen that because you can see 
the first data category shows us 2008 and the second gives us 2018. So very nice that they've used a decade to describe the difference between 2008 and 2018. Now, um, any examiner um, will be looking at this table um, before marking students' essays, and they're gonna be getting an idea of what they expect to see in the overview. Now, um, I have no affiliation with the British Council or IDP anymore. Uh, so I would be looking at this graphic and I'd be working out what um, I would hope to see uh, in terms of the overview. So what I would like to see is the fact that certain countries increase in growth and certain countries decrease in growth and other countries stay the same. So if we look, we can see that Angola increases in growth between 2008 and 2018. So an increase of 43%. Brazil in, uh, increases by 7%. Canada increases, Japan decreases. We can see the negative 2% between 2008 and 2018. Similarly, Nigeria, well, Nigeria, Pakistan increase, Romania decreases and Russia stays the same. Okay, so that's really the general understanding of this graphic. And that's why or any examiner would really hope to see for an overview for a band seven plus. So the overview would say something like um, overall five countries increase in population growth between 2008 and 2018. Uh, two countries decrease in population growth um, and one country stays the same, and so that country being Russia. So let's see what the student has said. They've said, overall, Brazil has the largest population in the year 2008 and was outnumbered by Pakistan after a decade. On the other hand, Angola had the greatest growth percentage, and in contrast, no growth percentage was noted in Russia. So you can see that here, this is their overview. So first of all, very nice that they start with overall, which clearly shows the examiner that they have an overview. However, they haven't really identified the overview correctly. What they've done is in fact, they've focused on the highest and the lowest levels. Um, now that's fine if you have a static graphic. So a graphic that shows you the data for one particular year, However, because we're looking at a trend that changes over time, so between 2008 and 2018, we, want, we would expect the overview to show how that trend has changed over time. So immediately, an examiner will be looking at this and thinking, okay, they've got an overview, but they haven't selected the overview appropriately or correctly because they're focusing on the details instead. Um, so, this isn't really creating a great impression for the examiner because they're already understanding that for task achievement, it's unlikely that this student will be able to get a band seven. So they're already in their mind thinking, this is going to be around band six, band 6.5 maybe, um, it could even be lower. Okay, so let's have a look at how we can correct some of the vocabulary and grammar in their overview. So overall, Brazil has the largest population in the year 2018 and 2008. Um, okay, so we would probably change this to had because when we're, when we're talking about a specific date in the past then we use the past simple and was outnumbered by Pakistan after a decade. Okay, so outnumbered isn't really the correct word to use here. Let's think about what else we could say. Brazil had the largest population in the, in the year 2008. Um, and let's just say, instead of saying and, we're going to change that to but, because we're introducing a contrast. But um, a decade later, it was Pakistan that had the greatest population. Okay, so we're going to just change that. 
On the other hand, Angola had the greatest growth percentage and in contrast, no growth was noted in Russia. So on the other hand is a linker, a good linker um, for introducing a contrast, um, except we usually use on the other hand in essays. In reports, we'd more likely use uh, however, or we would even use by contrast. So let's change that now. Let's take that out. Why is that? By contrast. Angela had the greatest growth percentage okay and then let's change this to while the rule seems to be acting up a little bit while no growth and so we wouldn't say while no growth percentage was noted in russia we just say while no growth was noted in russia is fine or we could say observed in russia would probably be a better word observed in Russia. Okay. Now the next thing the um, an assessor of IELTS task one is going to do is think about the structure that the student has used. Now, um, considering we have five countries that have increased and two countries that have decreased and one country that has stayed the same, Russia, we would expect to see maybe two or three paragraphs um, one paragraph would link all of the countries that have increased in growth and another country would, uh, sorry, another paragraph would link maybe the other countries. So Japan, Romania and Russia that have not increased in growth. Let's see if this student has done that. So they've started in 2008, Romania had the least population data with only 20 million followed by Angola with only 1 million difference and Canada with 33 million. Brazil had the largest population with 194 million followed by Pakistan with 173 million, Nigeria 158 million, Russia 143 million and Japan with 128 million in total. After a decade, Pakistan po Pakistani population outnumbered the Brazilians with only 1 million difference. Romanians decreased its population and still the lowest among the eight countries with only 19 million in total. Okay, so this, uh, this student hasn't really uh, linked all of the, the countries that have increased in population growth. Instead, they're just focusing on 2008, which is okay, it's, 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 at least it's logical. Um, but then in that case, we would expect the last paragraph to look at 2018 and the growth. And we can see that it's quite a small population, uh, sorry, a small paragraph. So already I'm thinking that they're going to score lower for cohesion, so coherence and cohesion. Uh, again, it's very unlikely that the student is going to be getting a band seven because their structure isn't so logical. So already the exam, uh, the exam or any assessor is thinking, okay, they're not band seven for uh, task response, um, and or task achievement, and they're not band seven for coherence and cohesion. So let's look into the paragraph and see how they're going to do for lexical resource, which is vocabulary and grammatical range and accuracy, which looks at the grammatical structures they use and the accuracy of the sentences that they have. So in 2008, Romania had the least population data. So we're going to change that to lowest. We don't say least data, with only 20 million, followed by Angola with only 1 million difference. Okay, with only 1 million less. So if Angola is 30 and Pakistan and Romania is, okay, so 1 million more. We're not going to say difference here. Difference is, is, is too vague a word. Yes, there is a difference, but is it less or is it more? Um, and then we're going to have a full stop here so that we're not trying to put in too much information in the first paragraph. Um, so instead, we're going to have 
um, Canada had a population of 33 million in 2008. Okay, now for the next sentence, we'd expect to see some sort of linker here because um, what an examiner doesn't want to see ultimately is someone just simply reporting the data without any analysis. Um, so let's put in something like further. So introducing more uh, data points for 2008. Further, Brazil had the largest population with 194 million, followed by Pakistan with 175, 173 million, Nigeria, 158 million, Russia, 143 million, and Japan with 128 million in total. Okay, so they're just simply listing the data without giving a good comparison. And that's something that we're going to be looking at a little bit later in this lesson, because that's really one of the differentiating points between a band six level student and a band seven level student. Um, <clears throat> after a decade, okay, so actually they are looking at 2018 here, Pakistani population. So let's change this, put in the Pakistani population outnumbered the Brazilians. So outnumbered is a bit of a strange word to use here. Um, so let's change this to was larger than Brazil's and then instead of with we're going to change that to by. So by only one million difference. So again they're using the word difference when they could be using a more specific word was larger than Brazil's by only 1 million. Okay, let's get rid of the word difference. And again, we'd expect to see some sort of contrasting word here or another word to, um, to link the next sentence together. So we're gonna put in finally. Finally, uh, finally, Romanians decreased its population. So it's not that Romania decreased its population. That sounds like something like some sort of horrible genocide or killing off a large <laughs> proportion of the population. So let's say Romania's, Romania's population decreased decreased and is still the lowest. Okay, we'll put and was still the lowest among the eight countries with only 19 million in total. Okay, so for Romania, they're only talking about 2018. Okay, and that's because maybe they mentioned Romania earlier. No, they didn't by the looks of things. So here again, the examiner is gonna be a bit confused. Why did they mention 2008 and 2018 data for some countries and they've only mentioned 2018 data for Romania? Um, now, if you're one of these students that's really going for band eight or band nine, it's really important that you include um, all of the data in your answer. Um, and you, you link that data with appropriate comparisons. Um, so again, this is going to be lowering the score um, for quite a few criteria. It's going to be lowering the score for task um, response or task achievement, because they're only mentioning um, a, a little bit of the data for Romania. And it's also going to be lowering the score for coherence and cohesion because they're inconsistent. Sometimes they're talking about 2008 and 2018 and sometimes they're talking about only 2018 so this isn't logical and it's going to score them lower let's continue and look at their second body paragraph now the first thing that any assessor would note is that it's a much smaller paragraph um, and that's slightly confusing because they're, the first paragraph is looking at 2008 uh, primarily and then we'd expect to see something like 2018 and the percentage change in the second body paragraph. But instead, they're just focusing on the percentage growth. So they say, as for the 
As for, let's get rid of that. As for percentage growth, both Japan and Nigeria have negative results. Okay, so we, we don't really say have negative results. Um, that's not accurately describing um, the graphic. So let's say uh, experienced a decrease in population. And then let's say over the period. So these words like experienced a decrease are very useful um, because it allows us to put in a, comp a, a noun phrase um, to describe the graphic. And basically what you want to have is, is a range of different structures for describing the data. And we have Angola had, has the highest percentage noted with 43%. Okay, so they've gone from talking about the countries that have negative growth to now the highest growth. And again, that's not necessarily the most logical way to talk about um, the data and especially the population change. There's also um, a kind of a slight confusion between using the present simple and the past simple um, for the students. So that's also going to uh, lower their score this time for grammatical range and accuracy. Uh, with 43% followed by Nigeria, 28%. So we could put in, so, so followed by Nigeria at 28%. Um, and Pakistan at 21%. Now a good way is sometimes to just put data in brackets because it allows you to quickly um, emphasize the data that, um, that backs up basically what you're saying. And then we've got a strange sentence here. We have no increased growth population was noted in Russia. So no increased population. So they've, they're having some problems with the past simple here. So let's change this, no increase in, and then not growth population, but population growth was noted in Russia. So uh, was noted is nice because it's, it's an example of the passive. So they're doing well there, but they need to get things like growth population to population growth. Okay, so what we're gonna do is look at what kind of score the original task would get. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna look at is their task achievement. This is sometimes called task response. And they're going to get, um, you know, a band seven-ish for the uh, introduction because they have a nice brief introduction that has a few grammar mistakes, but ultimately gets straight to the point of describing this graphic. Their overview is fine. They have an overview, which means it's going to be above band five, but they haven't really selected the data appropriately. So they're not going to be getting band seven. So band six is appropriate for them. Um, they have in comparisons of the data and, ana and sorry, comparisons and analysis of the data, well, yes, they've got some uh, comparisons of the data, but actually, if you look at um, a lot of their sentences like this one, they're simply just listing the data without much comparison, without much language to really explain whether this is a large change, a small change, or whether this is the most change or the least uh, amount of change over the two periods. Um, but they do have a little bit about that. So they're going to be getting around six plus for this, which would give them a band six um, for task achievement or task response. Um, now I'd like to remind you that this is um, in no way indicative of their score given by British Council IDP. Um, I have a website, English Pro Tips, and I do um, assessment um, and writing evaluation. Uh, based on the public band descriptors. So based on the public band descriptors, they would be looking at getting around band six for task achievement. Unfortunately, they've got quite a lot to change before they get to band seven level. Okay, coherence and cohesion. Well, they've got a nice two paragraph structure, um, but it's not really the most logical structure. Uh, it starts off being logical by looking at 2008 and then the percentage growth between the two dates. But actually, if you look inside 
the paragraphs, they're a little bit confused because even in the first paragraph, they talked about 2008 and then they go on to 2018. Um, but anyway, so it's, it's logical, but it's maybe not the most logical. The most logical I would say would be to divide the paragraphs into all of the countries that have increased um, and all of the other countries are the countries that have decreased and stayed the same between 2008 and 2018. Um, the next thing that you're gonna, uh, an assessor would be looking at is the linking words that you use. And actually um, there's quite a lot of nice linking words in this, uh, in this answer. We've got things like in 2008 comma, um, so that's a topic sentence which immediately shows the examiner what's going to be found in that paragraph. Um, and they've also got it here. They've got as for the percentage growth. So again, they're showing the examiner what should be in um, this in, in this paragraph. Um, however, they do miss opportunities to use linking words. So you can see I added words like finally. Um, what else did I add? Uh, further uh, by contrast. <clears throat> Um, although they did have on the other hand there. So um, an examiner or any assessor would be looking for which contra uh, which linking words you use to make your answers more coherent and cohesive. Um, they will also be looking at referencing and substitution and that's totally fine um, with this answer. It's, it's around band seven level, so that's great. But overall, this would score around band six for coherence and cohesion. So we're looking at six for task achievement, we're looking at six for coherence and cohesion. And then we're going to look now at lexical resource. And lexical resource is the vocabulary that um, the student uses. And in terms of vocabulary, um, they've got quite a lot of good vocabulary. Um, you know, things like percentage noted. Um, what else do we have? The largest percentage. So they've got um, superlatives, which is good. Um, population data, greatest growth percentage. So they've got some nice, um, uh, nice collocations. So they're going to do okay for lexical resource. However, they also have some uh, mistakes which lower their score uh, and their spelling is totally fine, which is another thing that the examiner or any assessor is going to be very careful about reading your answer and checking for good spelling. So make sure you guys have got good spelling in your answers. Um, and then we've got grammatical range and accuracy, which is looking at the structures used and the accuracy of those structures. And they're going to get around band six for grammatical range and accuracy. Um, and basically, you can see some of the corrections that I've, I've done here. There would be more corrections if I weren't doing this live and I was focusing entirely on um, looking at this, this answer and correcting all of the mistakes. But um, just from briefly looking over it, um, any assessor would be able to tell that it's not quite band seven level, which um, of course is the kind of magical score that most um, candidates are looking for. Um, now I'm gonna just quickly check if there's any um, chat at this stage. Let me see, how do I do that? So how do I check? Just click the chat, chat button. Okay, stop share. So should I just check in chat, see if there's any particular questions at this stage? Yes. It allows you to improve their equipment. Okay, so no particular questions. So what I'm gonna do in now is to look at um, how, how we could write a very good answer for exactly this graphic. Um, so let me share my screen again. How do I do that? Share screen. Okay. Now this is what um, I encourage my students on my course to do. Um, I run the website englishprotips.com um, where I really specialize in helping students to get band seven and, and actually above. Um, so I look for kind of high level students that really need to, um, to get that band seven and above, usually for um, entering into higher level education. Um, so this is what, what ultimately we could do. We would get this graphic and of course we'd be giving, given the, um, 
the rubric, which is say summarize the information. And we would want to immediately look at um, the data points in the table and beginning, begin to circle um, the information. So this is what I would do. So I would note, for example, that the population growth of Angola has increased. Likewise with Brazil, Canada, yes. Japan has decreased. Nigeria has increased. Pakistan increased. Romania decreased. And Russia stayed the same. And I would be physically um, writing this information on the question sheet. Uh, because by doing that, you're already getting an idea of what you're going to include in your answer. The next thing I'd be looking for would be the maximum and minimum values. So I'd see that Brazil had the largest population in 2008 and Romania had the smallest population um, in 2008. Likewise, or in 2018, Pakistan had the highest population and Romania continued to have the lowest population. Okay, so these are the kind of scribbles that I would do on the question paper. And with that information, I would be thinking to myself two things. Oh, sorry, population growth, Angola is the largest and Romania is the smallest population growth or rather the largest decrease in population. Okay, so with this information, I'd be thinking, okay, what am I gonna put in my overview and how am I going to order my essay? Now, my overview would be fairly simple. I've noticed that five countries increase, uh, one country stays the same, which is Russia, and two countries decrease. Okay, and that's what I'm going to put in my overview. And I'm also going to use that information to inform the order of my, of my report. So I'm gonna have my introduction, or we'll start with an introduction, but keep it brief. I'm gonna have the overview, where I talk about the five countries that have increased, the one country that stayed the same, and the two countries that have decreased. So, um, and then I'll have body paragraph one, where I'll talk about the countries that have increased, body paragraph two about the other countries. So namely, I'll be talking about in body paragraph two, uh, Japan, Romania, and Russia. So let's have a look at, first of all, how we would write the introduction. So this student had a really good introduction and here's a little cheat sheet that you can use. We'd have the graphic type, then a verb, then a description. Now we don't want to use the same wording as the rubric. So instead of saying the table below shows, we would say something like, the table presents information on the population growth of different countries between 2008 and 2018. So very simple introduction. And we want it to be simple because we want to be moving straight on to writing our overview and body paragraph, because that is really where um, examiners will be assessing you. They're not too bothered about the introduction. Okay, so we've got our graphic with all the scribbles and we're going to have an overview. So as I noted, we have five countries increased, one country stayed the same and two countries decreased. So this is gonna be my overview. Overall, five countries experienced an increase in population growth, Angola, Brazil, Canada, Nigeria, and Pakistan. One country, Russia did not change, and two countries saw a reduction in their population figures, Romania and Japan. Okay, so this is an absolutely fine overview. We're giving a general description of all of the countries, so we're not focusing on any country in particular, and because this is a dynamic table that shows a trend over a time, we're talking about how that trend has changed for each of the categories. Now, this would be around band seven, possibly band eight. Let's make it really, really good. And I would do that by doing what the other student did um, and focusing on maybe some of the salient points of this graphic. So it is noteworthy that the most considerable growth was in Angola and the most significant decline was in Romania. Okay, so we've just improved our overview uh, by um, pointing out um, some of the superlatives. So some of the extremes in extreme increase or an extreme decrease. Um, and this would be a kind of very high level overview for this particular graphic. Uh, if you're interested in, in learning to write overviews like this, then check out um, englishprotips.com where we um, go through all the different graphic types and I'll show you what you should be writing in your overview for each of the graphic types. And what I'll do is uh, a little bit later in this lesson, I'll show you a little bit of the behind the scenes of English Pro Tips. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna do is have uh, some comparisons of the data and, um, 
and some analysis. And this is really what separates a band six and a band seven class candidate is are they able to make comparisons and analyze the data? So we'd have something like this. Of the five countries that experienced population growth, the largest increase was seen in Angola. Now, this is the kind of sentence that can get you a very high score in um, IELTS because, first of all, it's considered um, an advanced structure because we're saying of the five countries that experienced population growth, the largest increase was seen in, in Angola. So this is a subordinate clause. Uh, and the other reason that this is going to get us a very high score is because we're, um, we're, we're pointing out salient features of the graphic. So we're saying there are five countries that experience population growth. However, the largest increase was seen in Angola. Okay. And there are lots of different structures that we can use when we're um, looking and analyzing data from task one. So let's have a look at a few more. The other African country in the sample, Nigeria, also experienced an increase in population, albeit not as great as Angola's. And then I've used gr uh, gr uh, brackets uh, to emphasize and back up my statement. Okay, so again, this is the kind of sentence that will get you a very high score in academic task one, and I'm gonna explain why. We have the other African country in the sample. Okay, so here I'm linking Nigeria and Angola as African countries, and that's showing a higher level of analysis. We're grouping them and we're using cohesive uh, structures to put those sentences together. So that's very good. We also have a, an advanced word. We have albeit, which you can see uh, towards the end of the sentence. Uh, albeit is a bit like nevertheless. And if you want to learn a bit more about how to use that word, then check out English Pro Tips um, on YouTube. And there's a video all about some advanced um, vocabulary that you can use. Huh? To academic to okay. Right. We're going to continue. Look at some of the other um, language. Pakistan experienced the third largest growth over the period at 21%. Okay, so having the third largest growth, again, is more advanced than simply saying Pakistan experienced growth over the period at 21% because we're using a superlative. So we're showing the assessor that we can use advanced structures when we're uh, analyzing the graphic. Russia was the only country that registered the same number of inhabitants in 2008 and 2018. Okay, so we're singling out Russia as the only country. So again, this is higher level um, writing because we're uh, identifying that all the other countries either increase or decrease. However, Russia stays the same. And we're showing the examiner that we've identified that. We're also using, um, 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 uh, advanced structure here because we're saying that registered the same number of inhabitants. So we're using inhabitants as a synonym for population or citizens in 2008 and 2018. Let's continue. Both Romania and Japan experienced a decline in their population figures. So again, we're linking Romania and Japan and we're showing the examiner, yes, we've identified that both of these countries decrease in their population. The greatest decrease was observed in Romania, which saw a 5% decrease between 2008 and 2018 from 20 to 19 million. So some things that I'd like to point out about this sentence, we're using a superlative, we're saying the greatest decrease, we also have a passive, was observed in Romania. So as soon as an examiner sees a sentence like this, they're thinking, okay, this is a high level student. And then we also have, um, a comma which saw a 5% decrease between 2008 and 2018. So this is a non-defining relative clause. And don't worry if you don't know what that is. Um, if you want to know what that is, then uh, check out my website, englishprotips.com. And um, in my academic task one course, I go through advanced grammar that you can use in academic task one. Um, and non-defining relative clauses, which is which saw a 5% decrease, is one of the best ways to really boost your score in academic task one. Unfortunately, we don't really have time to go into it in detail in this lesson, but the kind of thing that you should be um, looking into if you're aiming for band seven or above in your IELTS writing. Okay. 
Now, the next thing that you really want to be doing to get ready for academic task one is to be learning the most common words and then also the synonyms that are used instead of that word. So the most common words are words like increase, decrease, remain the same, uh, moderate, so as in a moderate increase, a moderate decrease, significant, also significant in increase, significant decrease, approximately, which is used when we're, we're saying that the data is not exactly 2000, maybe it's 2001, so we can say it is approximately 2000. And we can say it reaches the highest point because often we're describing a line graph and we want to talk about when something peaks, when it reaches its highest level. So we need to learn these words. These are absolutely crucial words for academic task one. Um, and we also need to learn synonyms for these words. So synonyms are words that mean the same thing as these words. Um, and by learning these kinds of synonyms, we're going to show the examiner that we have a range of vocabulary, which is what we need for a band seven or above in lexical resource. So instead of increase, we can say things like rise or climb. Instead of decrease, we can say fall, decline, drop, reduce, remain the same. We have plateau, which is exactly um, the same as remain the same. It's when a, um, a figure reaches a certain level and then it stays at that level. We can say levels out, remain steady, remains constant. We have moderate, we can say modest, significant, we can say substantial, marked, steep, or sizable. Approximately, we have um, roughly around about just above, just below. And for reaches the highest point, we have reaches the highest level or reaches the peak. Okay. So at this stage, let me see if I can take some questions about, um, about academic task one before we move on to task two. Okay, so if you do have a question, then um, then please ask it in the um, the chat part. Eli, okay, we have a so question from Facebook. Oh, I'm okay. Yes, could you explain again the relevance of spelling mistakes, please? I used to have around ten to fifteen spelling mistakes in my writing. I change an e for an i or a for e. Will that make me have less than seven in grammar? Yeah, um, um, unfortunately it probably will. It probably will mean that you score less than seven in grammar. Um, if you've got 10 to 15 spelling mistakes, then yeah, it's gonna be very difficult to get a seven in um, grammatical range and accuracy. Um, when it comes to the spelling mistakes, the assessor is going to be thinking, um, is this a slip? So is this a small mistake, but I know what they're trying to say. So I know the vocabulary, um, I know the word that this candidate or this um, IELTS test taker is using. Um, and, and if so, they're, they're still able to get a six. If they only have a few mistakes and they might be getting a band seven. And then the other side is if the, the examiner or the assessor is looking at your spelling mistake and thinking to themselves, I don't know what this word is. So if they're looking at it and they're thinking, I don't know what this word is because the spelling is so bad, then unfortunately, you're not even going to get a band six, you're gonna be getting a band five or below. Okay, so it's really about your ability to communicate in both task one and task two. Uh, I hope that answers your question. I've seen another question from Hazel uh, Marie, who says, uh, so how, how many minutes should we spend on writing task one and writing task two? So that depends on whether you're doing the general or academic IELTS. If you're doing the general IELTS, then I suggest 20 minutes for task one and 40 minutes for task two. Um, and that's because generally it's much easier to write a letter than it is to write one of these academic task one reports. Um, although, remember, you always want to give yourself around five minutes at the very end just to check over your um, answers. Uh, and sorry, check over your answers and check for spelling and small mistakes in your grammar. Um, I recently interviewed um, a student that got a band eight in the writing test. And um, her strategy was very interesting. She did the general IELTS and she said that she had finished within 35 minutes. 
And then she actually used 25 minutes to go through her answers and check and then recheck. And every time she checked, she found another mistake um, that she had made in her writing. Um, and then as a result, she was able to get band eight in IELTS writing, which is an unbelievably high score. Uh, if you want to see the interview with, um, her name is Deb, okay, it's very hard for me to pronounce, Debarbita. Well, she's from India, and you can watch the interview on my YouTube channel, which is English Pro Tips. Um, um, English Pro Tips and then IELTS preparation. Okay, so that's the general test. And then for the academic test, um, the report takes longer than 20 minutes if you're going to be writing a band seven, eight or band nine um, report. So unfortunately, it's, it's definitely the academic test is definitely harder than the general you need to give yourself around 25 minutes for the task one report. Um, and then um, that only leaves really 35 minutes for task two. Um, and in fact, maybe even 30 minutes for task two to just give yourself that five minutes at the end. Um, often a band seven, eight or nine um, answer for academic task one is going to be around 200 plus 250 words. Um, you just can't write a band eight or band nine answer in 150 words unless you have a process diagram or a map diagram. Uh, if you have a table or a line graph with a lot of data to get a band eight or nine, you're going to have to write um, definitely above 200 words. Unfortunately, it's, it's a very difficult test. And, and that's one of the reasons why um, students tend to score a lot lower in the writing part of the IELTS compared to other parts of the test. Um, and then we've got another question that says, my word count for task one was about 230. Is it OK to get band seven? Um, so I, I guess I've just answered that. Yes, it is. Um, 230 words is totally fine. Um, as long as it's above 150 words, your assessor is not going to be counting how many words you have. Um, they're going to be looking at the quality of your answers. However, it's very difficult to have a very, 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 very high quality answer if you're only writing 150 words. So definitely write more than 150 words, um, but um, don't worry about writing too many words. As long as what you're writing is accurate and you're making lots of comparisons between the data, then um, yes, you can, um, uh, then, then don't worry about any limits. Okay, we've got another question. Is it better to start and focus on task two instead of task one? Um, okay, so for the academic test, what I recommend is you open your question paper and you'll see task one and task two. Read task two um, and then go to start writing task one first. And the reason for that is if you read task two, but you start writing task one first, you're going to begin to think of ideas that you're going to write in your essay um, before, uh, so that when you finish academic task one, you're ready to, you've already got your ideas ready for academic task two, so for writing your essay. Okay, I'm not gonna take any more questions because we need to move on to looking at task two. Um, and we're probably not gonna have time to do that in its entirety as we have done with academic task one. So um, let me just share my screen. And let's find. Okay, so we had, this is the question that we were given. Teenagers should have regular exams at secondary school as this will prepare them better for life after leaving school. To what extent do you agree, disagree with this? To what extent do you agree or disagree with this statement? Okay, so the first thing that I would expect somebody to do is to notice it says teenagers, so that they need to focus on teenagers. If they're focusing on primary school students, that's going to be a band five for task achievement. The other thing is regular exams. So we're not just talking about one exam a year, we're talking about regular assessment. Next thing we're gonna look at is secondary school. So again, they need to focus on secondary school. They can't be talking about 
regular exams at university, college or primary school. It's about secondary school. Um, and then this is the crucial part here. It says, as this will prepare them better for life after leaving school. Okay, so it's not just about exams helping students in school, it's about helping students after school. Okay, so these, this is something that um, certainly a band seven or above uh, student would notice. And they need to mention this in order to get those high scores. So let's see how this candidate has done. Some people believe that high school, school, high level schools, adolescents should be evaluated by methodical examinations. It tends to, okay, so let's, let's just start correcting this as we go along. <clears throat> Some people believe that Adolescent, so it's very nice. They've used a synonym for teenagers. They've used adolescents, so that's great. Adolescents should be evaluated by methodical examinations. Okay, methodical examinations and um, regular exams are not the same thing. So that's, that's a bit of a red flag for me already. Um, they've tried to use a synonym, but they haven't really used the right synonym. Now, when you're not sure if a word is a synonym, it, synonym it's better not to use it at all. And they've already got a synonym for teenagers. Oh, yeah. Uh, someone commented on the chat. They've said yeah. that they cannot be able to see the task two slide. Oh, they can't see task two? Yes. So what can they see right now? <laughs> uh, it's the most common words, I think. And then it is zoomed in. Oh, OK, right. So. Yeah, that's that's very important that they should be able to see this. Oh, okay. stop. <laughs> Sorry, guys, if you've been looking at the wrong um, the wrong part as I've been talking, it must be very, very confusing for you. OK, now I presume you can see it. Can you let me know, um, Gladys, can people see the right uh, information? Yes. yes, it is. Some people believe that at high level schools, adolescents, there you go. OK. Right. So some people believe that adolescents should, um, let's just change this and say have, um, or should, we're going to use the passive here, should be given regular exams. Uh, it tends to make them ready to meet the challenge of the outer world. Okay. So again, they've tried to use a synonym, but outer world and life after school isn't really the same. Um, also, it tends isn't really appropriate here. Um, one, good, one good structure is to say things like they believe, especially when we have some people before. So they believe that it prepares um, students for, and it, instead of saying life after leaving school, let's say for post school life, which is an accurate synonym. However, others are of the view that it would be more stressful for them and might affect them adversely. In my opinion, timely assessments. Okay, so that's quite nice. They've got some people and they've got, an, um, however, others have the view. In my opinion, timely assessment of student performance is mandatory as it brings multifarious benefits for them. Okay, thus this essay absolutely agrees with the former view. In my, okay, let's see how we could make this a little bit clearer. However, in my opinion, it's not really timely. Um, let's go for frequent assessment. Uh, and we don't need to say of students performance is beneficial for, um, for them. Okay, we could say, and then we don't really see that um, thus this essay absolutely agrees with the form of you because we've already just said what our position is saying, in my opinion, frequent assessments. So this should be R, are beneficial. Um, and then let's just change this to life for life after leaving school. So 
when we give our position in IELTS, we want to make sure that this um, directly relates to the question you're being asked. So when we have a phrase like, in my opinion, or I would argue that, um, feel free to just use the same words as, um, as, the, as the rubric, as, the, as your question asks, because you need to show the examiner that you are addressing the exact question. So already again, at this stage, I'm thinking, well, what is this multifarious, like, uh, sorry, why, should, why is it mandatory? So already in my mind, I'm thinking, well, this student is actually a little bit off topic. And when you're off topic, that's the kind of thing that can really dramatically lower your score. Um, first of all, periodical exam examinations are the tool to detect the flaws in a student's learning pattern. Okay, so immediately I'm thinking, well, does that relate to their post-school life? So their life after leaving school? And I'm thinking, well, no, it doesn't really. Um, detecting flaws in a student's learning pattern is not the same as preparing students for post-school life or not preparing post-school life. So, so immediately I'm thinking, okay, this, this student is probably not going to get a band seven. They're going to be getting band six, possibly lower. Um, and then I'm, when I see this as the second, um, as the beginning of the second sentence, moreover, um, it's clear to me that that's all they're going to say about this idea. And they're going to move on to another idea. So they say, moreover, it assists to comprehend themselves and insist them to work on their weaknesses. Okay, so they've just introduced their first idea and immediately they've moved on to their second idea. Um, again, this, you can't, this is something that's going to lower your score. In IELTS, for band seven, you need to develop your ideas, um, which means you take one idea and you, um, you explain it, you give details about it, and ideally you give an example about why you think that idea is relevant to the question you've been asked. So immediately I've seen they've got one idea in the first sentence, they've got one idea in the second sentence, and here they have, in addition, frequent exams during an academic year provides them as an opportunity to score the higher ranks at the final evaluation criteria. Okay, so three sentences, three ideas, which means none of their, none of their ideas are fully developed. And from looking at these ideas, they're not really related to post-school life. So um, an assessor would already know that this candidate cannot score um, band seven. Now we're running pretty short on time, so I'm not going to correct this entire essay um, live. If the student who wrote this wants me to um, correct it, then I'll, I'll, I'll kindly uh, correct it for them and I'll send it over to them. But um, I, I did read their essay earlier and I, and I counted the amount of ideas they had. They had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine ideas. Okay, so you don't need nine ideas in your, in your answers. In fact, by having nine ideas, you're not fully developing any of your ideas and therefore you're going to get a lower score for task two. So yes, you could probably still get band six. You could probably still get band 6.5 but it's unlikely that you're going to be getting band seven. Um, the next thing is how many of these ideas are actually related to post-school life, so life after leaving school. Detect flaws in students' learning patterns? Um, no, this isn't related to post-school life. Learn about themselves? Yes, they're, they're learning about themselves and that could help them in post-school life because they're more aware of their skills, um, which might help them for getting a job. So, okay, that, that's an acceptable um, idea. Encourages them to work on their weaknesses. Um, yes, that could be um, encouraging, that could help them in post-school life. Um, helps them to score well in the final exam. No, that's just, that's not really related to the question because that's talking about how exams help students in other exams which you would have to really show why that relates to post-school life. Um, encourages them to be competitive and industrious. Yes, that could relate to post-school life. Um, and stress of examinations help them in later life. So that's something they talk about later on in their essay here. And um, this is really a good idea because, um, because of this 
this part here helps them later in life. So at this stage, the examiner is thinking, okay, actually, wait, they do have ideas that relate to, um, to the actual question that they're being asked. But unfortunately, it's a little bit too late for this student to be getting that band seven. Provides them with strength and confidence. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a, good, um, and a good idea that they could include. Broadens their horizons. Um, yeah, that, that could be related to um, post-school life and then helps them become a recognizable and prestigious member of society. And yes, that could relate to post-school life. So they have some ideas that do relate to the question and some ideas that um, don't fully relate to the question. Um, if you are aiming for band seven, then you need to make sure that all of your ideas relate directly to the question and that those ideas are um, developed with an example. Now, what we're going to do is have a look at, um, at how we could make an essay like this a little bit better. So, going to now look at the slides for task two. Share screen. Okay, Gladys, can you quickly just confirm that people can see the slides? It says agree, disagree essays. Yes. Okay, great. So this is the question they're given. Teenagers should have regular exams at secondary school as this will prepare them better for life after leaving school. To what extent do you agree or disagree? This is a very typical IELTS question. Um, it was invented by English Pro Tips, the website I work for. Um, but it's, it's used to be very similar um, to the actual exam and specifically the, the questions that you can get in task in the writing test. So agree, disagree essays are the most common questions that you get in task two. So it's important that you prioritize practicing agree, disagree essays. Um, the other question types that you can be asked are advantage, disadvantage essays. Uh, discussion essays where it says discuss both these views and give your own opinion and then you also have double questions where it's like a problem and solution or a cause and a reason um, sorry a cause and, and a solution and then you can also have direct questions however if you're short on time what you need to be focusing on, on is these agree disagree essays because they are so common in writing task too and um they would look like this. You'd have the statement and the question. So the statement would be the first part and the question would say something like, to what extent do you agree or disagree? To what extent do you agree or disagree with this statement? Do you agree or disagree with this opinion? Do you agree or disagree? So you can immediately identify an agree or disagree question. Now, the next thing you need to be thinking about is how are you gonna structure your essay? So this student went wrong in that they, they had too many ideas ultimately that they were trying to cram into one essay. Um, now, I recommend to my students three different essay structures, depending on their level of English and what school they're aiming for. So we have the completely agree, disagree, which is the simplest um, essay structure. We also have a 70-30 structure, which is where we mostly agree or mostly disagree. And then we have a very advanced essay structure that I actually only recommend if you are already band seven and you're looking to get around band 7.5 and band eight. And many of my students have been able to use this structure um, to get a high score. However, uh, I don't recommend this if you're around band six or band 6.5 and looking to get band seven because it's a much more complicated structure to use. Now, in the completely agree or disagree structure, which is the first one and the simplest structure, we'd have the introduction where we introduce the topic and respond to the question. So your introduction needs to do two things and two things only, introduce the topic and respond to the question. So it has to be short and simple, which gives you, gives you more time to write your body paragraphs, which is really what the examiner is going to be looking at. You have paragraph one, where you have one reason why you agree. Now that's one place where the student went wrong. In their paragraph one, they had four reasons why um, why they thought that um, why they agreed with the, why they agreed with the statement. Um, 
Did they agree with the statement? Yeah, where they, where they agreed with the statement. Instead, I recommend just have one reason why you agree and develop that um, reason. And I, I, we'll look at an example a little bit later. They'd have a second paragraph where they have another reason why they agree. And then they have the conclusion. So where the student that we looked at had something like eight ideas to, to, to use this structure well, you only really need two ideas as long as they're um, as long as they're well developed. And this structure is enough to get a band seven plus in IELTS, because what the examiner is looking for is how you communicate and you develop your ideas, not how many ideas you can think of in 40 minutes. OK, the next structure we have is slightly more complex and for students that feel very comfortable with the completely agree or disagree structure and are looking for something that they can um, impress the examiner with. And here we have the introduction again, exactly the same, introduce the topic, respond to the question. Paragraph one is one reason why we agree. Paragraph two is one, the second reason why we agree. Now I put this in brackets because if you're short on time, don't write this paragraph. And then paragraph three, one reason why some people disagree. Okay, so they've said, yes, I agree with this statement. However, here's a reason why other people disagree. Okay, so this is what I call this the 70-30 structure. And then we would always end with the conclusion where we restate our opinion. Okay, now finally, we're gonna look at the most advanced structure, which I won't recommend unless you're band seven already and looking for band uh, band 7.5 or band eight, because it's it, it's just much harder to write this well. Introduction does the same thing. It introduces the topic and responds to the question. Paragraph one shows one reason why we agree. Paragraph two shows the second reason why we agree. And again, we don't write this if we're short of on time. Um, and then paragraph three shows one reason why um, people disagree and then a rebuttal. So a rebuttal is saying, um, some people think that uh, this is a reason why, uh, or this is a reason that they disagree with the statement. And then you say, however, I would say that. And then you contrast their opinion with your own and you say why you don't think they have a good argument. Um, something that's slightly more advanced and we're gonna be actually looking at that structure in today's lesson. Finally, we have the conclusion where we restate our opinion. Okay, so which essay to choose depends on how much time you have, how good your English is, um, and what score you're aiming for. If you're aiming for band seven, then completely agree, uh, and the 70-30 structure are totally fine, stick to them because they're easier to write. If you're aiming for a really high level um, essay and you know that you're capable of that, then try practicing the 70-30 structure at, with the rebuttal at home, and if you feel confident with it, then uh, go for it in the exam. Just make sure you have enough time and that your English is good enough. Okay, so the first thing we do is underline the key words when we saw a question like this. I've done that here. And then we would start to brainstorm ideas. Now, when we're brainstorming ideas, we do this by thinking of the question from multiple perspectives. So life after leaving school. Well, what happens after leaving school? People go to university or they go to work. Now, <clears throat> at home in practice, I would write agree and disagree on the question paper. I wouldn't do this in the real test because I wouldn't have time. But at home, it's good to get into the habit of taking your time to brainstorm and to really think about the question. Okay, so agree. Um, well, if students go to university, they have lots of practice doing exams um, before they have the difficult university exams. So that's good. If students have lots of exams in high school, they'll feel fully prepared for the difficult exams at university. If they go to work, then by doing lots of exams, they're learning a range of skills like time management and working under pressure. And as the students said earlier, dealing with stress. Now we know that these are very useful um, skills for the world of work. Now, in terms of the disagree um, ideas, well, if teenagers in high school spend all of their time cramming for exams, they don't really have time for real learning and developing critical thinking skills. Also, 
if, um, well, in the world of work, you actually don't really have that many exams in a lot of professions. So why do we spend so much time in high school doing so many exams if you don't actually have exams at work? So do you see the way the plan is, is saying, okay, you go to university or you go to work and then immediately thinking about the ideas related to those um, categories to university and work. Now we're interested in the 70-30 plus rebuttal structure for this lesson. So a rebuttal would be something like this. And they say, so we'd say, well, the position is we agree. And we'd say, some people think that teenagers spend all of their time cramming for exams. And then my rebuttal would be something like this. Well, it depends on how those exams are carried out because really exams can be carried out in a good way as well um, to promote learning and to promote critical thinking skills. Exams aren't necessarily all about cramming. So here again, while planning, I'm thinking about my rebuttal to the disagree um, arguments. And then for workers, the disagree idea was that there are very few exams after high school in the world of work, but workers still benefit from the experience of having done exams at school because really well, the skills that we learned. Now for this essay, we don't need to have two rebuttals. We only need one. Um, and that's always the case. When you, when you have a rebuttal, just mention one reason why other people disagree and explain one reason why you don't agree with those people. So this is what our structure is gonna look like. Okay, I'm not gonna go through that in too much detail just to save time. But if you've got a recording of this lesson, um, then feel free to go through this um, plan in a bit more detail. And in fact, um, this video is also available on the English Pro Tips uh, YouTube page, right? Out, I think it's called um, Task 2, How to Get a 7 Plus. And you'll find it if you look, go to English Pro Tips on YouTube and then you browse through the, um, browse through the videos. Okay, so introduction has to do two things, introduce the topic and respond to the question. Here's one. Regular exams are an important feature of secondary school education. However, there is debate as to whether they prepare teenagers for post-school life. I would argue that they do. Okay, so this introduction does exactly those two things. It introduces the topic. It says regular exams are an important feature of secondary school education. However, there is debate as to whether they prepare teenagers for post-school life. And then it responds to the question. It says, however, I would argue that they do. Now, it's very important to have your position in the introduction. And then we move on to body paragraph one. Now, a body paragraph should do or should have three sections to it, or rather two sections and, and a third section, I, ideally. It has your topic sentence, your development, and a link. So the topic sentence introduces your idea the development gives usually an example or some way of, um, of uh, explaining in a bit more detail your idea. And then the link explains why that quest, why your idea relates directly to the question. So I'm not gonna read it all out, but again, if this is a recording, then this is something that you can look at in a bit more detail, or you can um, go to the English Pro Tips YouTube pay page and um, go through this essay in a bit more detail. And then the second reason is why I, or why, oh, so and a second reason why I agree. Again, this is something that we wouldn't put in if we were running short of time. Take your time, read through this um, paragraph in your own time, we're gonna move on. And then the third reason is why other people disagree and then why I don't agree with those people. So we have the paragraph um, starting an argument against regular exams in school is, and then we have the rebuttal, which is an orange and it says, however, I would argue that this is a matter of how tests are carried out. Okay, so feel free to look over that and read it in your own time. And then finally, the conclusion just has to do one simple thing. It just has to restate your position. One thing that I see very regularly from students that aren't ready for the IELTS test is that they start to introduce new ideas in their conclusion. Don't do this. You just need to respond. Uh, sorry, you just need to restate your position. So a conclusion can be simple like this. In conclusion, 
While I acknowledge that exam-oriented education can fail to prepare certain skills needed for post-school life, I would argue that teenagers should be given regular exams because it provides good practice for future testing in further education and develops a range of skills that will help teenagers when they start work. Okay. Right, let's, uh, I'm gonna take um, a few questions now and then I'm gonna have to run off. So if you do have any questions, then just write them in the chat box. Okay. I can't see any questions on, um, on the chat. So what I'm gonna do is just show you a little bit of what's in English pro tips so that you can get an idea. Oops. So let's go share screen. And there you go. Okay. So this is uh, English pro tips. This is my website and you have various courses. You have all of your essays stored. You have model essays that you can learn from. Um, there are a community of people that are also aiming for a seven plus in IELTS and then they write their essays here and they get feedback. Now, what I want to show you is um, one of the courses that I think could help a lot of you out there getting ready for your IELTS essay and your IELTS writing test. And that is the mini course for IELTS academic writing. Now, these are all paid courses. They're not free, unfortunately, um, but they are very, very useful. And what we're gonna do is look at task two, and I'm gonna show you a model essay that we, for task two. And we're going to answer some of the questions together as a group. So this is very typical of English pro tips. You'd have the essay question and then a model essay that you can learn from. And I really think reading model essays is one of the best ways to improve your essay writing skills. Although the best way is actually to write the essays yourself. Okay, so let's work through this together. Regular exams are an important feature of secondary school education. However, there is, now we have two options. However, there is debating as to whether they prepare teenagers for post-school life, or there is debate as to whether they prepare students for post-school life. Now, unfortunately, I can't see your answers, but I hope that most of you would choose debate, which is the correct answer. Okay, I would argue that they do. And then we move on to body paragraph one. Now, what's a good way to start body paragraph one? Well, it's with a topic sentence. So we, when we have a verb at the very beginning of a sentence, would we have it in a infinitive form or a gerund form? So would we say, have frequent exams at high school ensures that teenagers have something or having? Again, I can't see your answers. I hope that many of you would put having. So having frequent exams at high school ensures that teenagers have had Okay, now two words to choose, or, choose from, have had something examination practice before continuing to higher levels of education. The word is ample, which means a lot, a lot of examination practice before continuing to higher levels of education. In, okay, farther or further education. Now, which is the correct uh, phrase for talking about university education? Is it further education or father education? The answer is further education. So in further education, it is almost certain that students will be tested in one way or another. This may be practical. For example, a vocational course will require students to pass practical exams or academic. University students are evaluated on coursework type tests for more end of year exams or a combination of both. Okay. Now, when we're elaborating and when we're um, showing or developing our ideas, which of these do you think would be a good linking word to use? Now, bearing in mind, we have a comma immediately after. 
So the answer is hence. So hence, many exams at secondary school provide a foundation of experience which prepares teenagers for the tests they will encounter in further education. Regular exams also push teenagers to develop a range of skills that are useful in the world of work. For example, taking an exam requires a student to plan, prepare and perform in the test, thus developing time management capability, resiliency and the ability to deliver under pressure. Now, we want to refer to the skills. Would we say those skills or these skills? Now, because we've just mentioned them in the previous sentence, we're going to say these skills are, we've got two words. One of these means very valuable. And the answer is invaluable. So these skills are invaluable in a professional set setting where it is essential to be able to organize the workload and meet deadlines. An argument. So now we're giving the other side of the argument, an argument against regular exams in school is that it moves the focus away from learning and onto preparing for exams. So here we're introducing the idea that we don't agree with. Exam oriented education is often accused of teaching the test rather than providing students with a fulfilling learning experience. As a result, these students often fail or lack the ability. The answer is lack. So lack means there's not enough of something and it's a very useful word for task two. Lack the ability to evaluate and engage critically with new information. This causes problems for students when they enter university and have to show critical thinking skills. Okay, now I want to introduce my rebuttal. I want to say why I don't agree with this. So I would use one of these linking words. Bear in mind it's a contrast. So we're gonna use however. However, I would argue that this is a matter of how the tests are carried. So here we have a phrasal verb, a test of how te as well, uh, a matter of how tests are carried out. Education systems should be structured in such a way that tests and exams are a test of competence, knowledge, or at least remembered information, rather than being the main focus. The fact that exams and tests can be carried out poorly is not, in my opinion a good argument for not having them. In conclusion, argument or while, the answer is while. So while is a very useful um, structure. While with a subordinate clause is very useful in the conclusion. While I acknowledge that exam oriented education can fail to prepare certain skills needed for post school life, I would argue that teenagers should be given regular exams because it provides good practice for future testing in further education and develops a something of skills. Would you say collection or range of skills? So we're gonna say range of skills. So we've got 15 out of 15 in this model essay. Now, um, if you want to learn more about, or if you found this lesson useful, then check out englishprotips.com. And um, they have, it's only for the academic IELTS at this moment. But if, you, if you're interested, you can click on access to all academic IELTS courses and you can pay monthly or in six months chunks, which is what most students like to do. So they have ample time to prepare for the exam or one year. And at the moment we have a discount as well, which is um, when you click and become a member, then you can use the code IELTS30 to get 30% off your first payment. Okay, right, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you and it's been a real pleasure to be part of the um, Filipino group for IELTS nurses. Very cool. Um, yes. uh, yeah, so thank you. Very much. Question. Yep. There's a question for you from Hazel. Yeah. Sir, mm -hmm. what if I don't have any idea to answer the question in writing task two? What should I do? Okay, so um, let me just quickly plug in my laptop because I've just seen I'm at 9%. And I don't want that to go... <laughs> to suddenly go off. Okay, so, so what you need to do is to focus on idea generation. And I'm just going to quickly um, show you a video that I made um, on idea generation, which is you know, one of the pain points for a lot of IELTS students. 
So let me just get onto YouTube and then I'll share my screen in a second. Okay, let me share my screen now. I'm getting the hang of this Zoom video live, I think. Okay, so here you go. You've got a lot of videos here that can help you. And this is the, um, this is the video that's gonna help you here. And what we do in this video is we look at um, five tips. I think it's five anyway. Um, yeah, five tips for how to think of ideas in the, um, in the IELTS essay task two question. Um, and there's also a free PDF as well that basically uh, asks you 99 questions. And by answering these 99 questions, you begin to think of a lot of the common themes and topics that appear in IELTS because ultimately um, it's the same themes and topics that appear again and again and again. So by learning these themes and topics and especially by learning um, there we go. And especially by learning um, vocabulary related to these themes and topics, you're going to feel a lot more prepared for writing um, your essays for, um, for task two. All right, another question from Shane. Hi, Sir Eli, for academic, is it better to start and focus in task two than in task one? Well, um, you're probably aware that task two is worth two thirds of your score and task one is worth one third of your score. But from my experience, um, uh, a lot of IELTS test takers perform worse in academic task one compared to task two. And so by focusing on task one, they can actually boost their IELTS score considerably. Um, if, if you're aiming for a band seven or above, you need really need to be very comfortable with both task two and task one. And so I wouldn't necessarily recommend only focusing on one. Okay, from Joe, shall we use approximation in line graph at all times? Uh, so approximation being um, phrases like, um, the figure was approximately 200. The figure was uh, circa 300. So circa is another uh, phrase for approximately. Um, no, you, you shouldn't use it at all times. Um, it's, it's good to be specific when you're reporting the data in task one. Um, however, if you do have a number like 201, 202, and most of the other numbers are um, rounded numbers, then you can just say was approximately 200 or was circa 200 or was in the ballpark of 200. And, um, and by using that vocabulary, you're showing the examiner that you can report specific data and you can also report when um, it's not clear exactly what the data is. All right, I think that's all. So any parting words for our members, Eli? Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I don't know any of them personally, but um, you know, I, I had a, a Filipino nurse actually on um, on my website and doing my courses, and it and it was such a pleasure to teach her. In fact, there's actually a an interview with her. She um, when she arrived on my course, um, she was around band six in the um, in the IELTS writing test, and by by the end of the course, she was band seven point five. Um, and it was really, um, so this is the video here. Uh, it's a, a, um, a, ca a student called Noemi, who's from the Philippines, but actually living in Denmark at the moment. And it was wonderful to see, you know, how diligent she was. She really did, she went through all of the lessons. She did all of the assignments. And um, he, you know, she ends up really improving her IELTS score. And um, she got way beyond the score that she even needed to become a nurse in the UK, which is ultimately what she's doing. And I think she's a great example of, um, of someone that can, that, you know, has the right approach to preparing for the IELTS test because it's such a difficult test. Uh, and it takes many years to get, to get a score like a band 7.5 in writing, which is what she got. Um, but I think she's an example of someone that can put in hard work and dedication into um, into those kind of into into such a difficult exam and then come out on top and um, and so yeah I'm, I'm very excited that 
you know, uh, that you guys have a group to help more people like Noemi um, to get the IELTS score that they need and to be able to continue to a country of their choice and into a profession of their choice. So thank you very much for, um, for hosting such a productive Facebook group. All right. Thank you, Eli. So on behalf of the IELTS Filipino Nurses Group and for the administrator, administrators, uh, Sir Jeff and Mr. M, Sir Marvin. So thank you, Eli, for raising us your presence and giving us your expertise tonight. So we're hoping that we can still see you next time. <laughs> so good night from the Philippines. Okay, and thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, rest well. I'll continue with the rest of my day. You guys sleep well over there in the Philippines. Thanks, Thank you. bye. bye